that as well. Um, so just so you guys kind of know a little bit about us. How many of you have heard of our firm before? How many of you have an estate plan currently? Okay, a good amount of you. How many of you have looked at your estate plan recently? <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Normally I don't get any hands up for that one, so that's good. Okay. Well, today we're going to talk about the importance of an estate plan, what type of documents you might need in place in order to you know, have um, your estate plan be effective or effective as possible um, in your circumstances. So um, who is your why? So maybe you're doing estate planning to protect yourself, um, you know, to provide for a spouse, a child, grandchildren, maybe it's other family members. Um, you know, for me, it's my husband and my um, soon-to-be daughter. She's due in November, so um, we're excited about that. But we definitely want to make sure we have a plan in place in case something happens to me or my husband. So, um, you know, that's everybody has a why. That's mine. Um, and what's yours? So you always want to think about that when you're doing your estate plan. Um, and please, if anybody does have any questions as we go, um, you know, if you feel like you're going to forget your question, just raise your hand, and I'm happy to answer that too. Um, so why should you care? Um, you know, you want to protect your hard-earned assets that you earned over your lifetime. Maybe you have a family business. Maybe you have some retirement savings. Um, you know, do you want some form of protection and be able to stay in control? Those are all reasons why we might create an estate plan. And so, um, you know, what happens? So basically, you know, is there going to be control over what beneficiaries receive your estate? We want to make sure that, you know, the timing of when those beneficiaries have received their part is appropriate. Um, we want to make sure that it fits with your purpose of having your estate plan. And then also, you know, we want to avoid a mess and make sure things are clear for our beneficiaries. So, you know, make sure that we have that peace of mind as we age to make sure that, you know, if something happens to us, our documents are all in place to make sure that our loved ones are taken care of. And then our things that we have are passed to the people we want them to go to. Um, so like I talked about, um, protection, clarity, peace of mind. So how do we get there? Um, well, that starts with good legal documents. You know, we want to make sure that we have certain documents in place. So I always tell my clients, I tell my family members, everybody, anyone over 18 should have well-crafted legal documents. They should have at least a power of attorney, one for finances and one for health care. They might have one for mental health as well, but not always. Sometimes that's combined with the health care power of attorney. Um, they should have a living will. Um, and then also a last will and testament and possibly a trust. So almost everybody's going to need those powers of attorney, and almost everybody's going to need a will. Not everyone needs a trust, but sometimes it's a good idea, and we'll talk more about that today. Um, so again, we're going to create organization by having an estate plan. We're going to have um, you know, beneficiary designations as part of that as well. And most importantly, we want to have a comprehensive, holistic plan that's going to account for everything that you have, as well as your wishes. So um, planning for life and after death. Um, you know, during your lifetime, the documents that are going to kind of help you and your loved ones take care of you if something happens to you and you can't make decisions anymore. Um, the powers of attorney, so financial and health care powers of attorney, and living will. And sometimes if you have a trust, that helps too during your lifetime. So all those documents are going to work together during your lifetime to make sure that you're taken care of and that somebody has the ability to take care of you and make decisions for you if you can't make those decisions anymore. Um, after death, your will and your trust are, if you have a trust, are things that will work for you on your behalf after your passing. So we'll start out by talking with, about financial powers of attorney. Um, those are going to be, you know, pretty much anything that you can do um, in your lifetime. You know, make decisions about, you know, your bank accounts. Maybe you have real estate. Um, you know, things like that. Those are all things that your agent might be able to control, but you have to have specific powers listed in your financial power of attorney. So, you know, I have a lot of people come into my office, and the first thing I always ask them is, do you have a financial power of attorney? And if you don't, my first thing is, okay, we need to get one of those in place ASAP, because that's a real important document. So a financial power of attorney and a written document where one person, the principal, so that would be, you know, any of you, 
um, authorized on behalf of the agent, so anybody that you're appointing as your agent, to act on your behalf. So they're going to be that decision maker for you. So why is this important? Well, we don't just want to leave it to luck, right? I mean, we don't want to, you know, have a, an accident occur and then, you know, be in a situation where we might need someone to act for us. But if we don't have these documents in place, we're kind of leaving that to chance because what happens when that occurs is the court has to get involved and guardianships a lot of times end up happening. And so that's a scary thought for a lot of people because it's not in their control anymore. It's in the court's hands and they can decide. And a lot of times it is the family members, but sometimes it's not. And so having a power of attorney makes sure that you're not relying on luck to get this done. You're going to make sure yourself that you have these documents in place. So, um, you know, why is it the most important document? Well, a lot of folks think that, you know, oh, I'm married, my, my spouse will just take care of it, you know, they have authority to do everything for me. But under the law, you know, if you don't plan ahead, like I talked about, that guardianship can come into play because even sometimes a spouse needs a power of attorney in order to act. So, you know, don't, don't rely on those misconceptions that a lot of folks say, oh, your spouse can just take care of it. No, that's not true. That power of attorney needs to be in place appointing your spouse as that agent. Um, you know, just a little bit more on guardianships. They are very time consuming. They take some time to set up, usually about three months to set up a guardianship. Um, the typical cost, you know, for um, nursing home, we know is around 9,000 or more a month. Um, and so when you think about it, you know, those expenses, they add up over time, right? And if we don't have somebody who's going to take care of that for us, well, that's, that's pretty, you know, scary. Like, what if you don't have someone to pay your bills? If it takes three months to appoint a guardian, you know, you're in, if you're in a facility for three months and there's no one there to pay your bills, what's going to happen? Are they going to kick you out? <laughs> Hopefully they're not going to do that, you know, but... A lot of times that's a, a scary thought that a lot of people come across. Um, what other types of financial powers of attorney are there? So we talk about financial, we talk about health care, and we talk about springing. So those are the three like big name power of attorney terms that you're going to hear. Um, so we talked about you know making sure we have good legal documents in place. Are all powers of attorney created equally? No. I have seen some pretty bad ones come across my desk, and we want to make sure that you have one of the good ones to be able to be fully protected. Um, so, you know, what, what kind of things do your power of attorney for finances, what can they do for you? Um, again, they can open and close bank accounts. They can deal with real estate, you know, sell that for you, lease it for you, whatever they need to do. They can defend you in litigation if you were, you know, in some type of lawsuit. Um, they can make limited gifts of your estate if needed. Um, and sometimes they can even create revocable trusts to help avoid probate um, for your benefit. Um, you know, they typically do, most, most financial powers of attorney like that you would find on the internet, um, you know, those aren't, are, going to have, are not going to have unlimited gifts. Um, so sometimes it's important to have unlimited gifts in order to, you know, be able to apply for certain government benefits and things like that. Um, most powers of attorney are not going to allow somebody to create an irrevocable trust um, or create a special needs trust. Um, and most powers of attorney are not going to deal with digital assets. So just making sure that you meet with a good attorney who knows you know, what needs to be included in the power of attorney is really important so that you can make sure that you have you know, the, the right pieces of that document for your agents to be able to help you the most. Um, there are recent changes that occurred in powers of attorney. Now, you might be thinking in 2018, that's not that recent, but in terms of the law, it's, it's pretty recent for us still. Um, so, you know, in 2018, there was some changes to the power of attorney that basically, you know, there were some problems in the old law that were causing, um, you know, banks and other institutions to not accept certain powers of attorney. And so, you know, if you do have a power of attorney that is over, um, you know, older than 2018, you may want to have an attorney look that over and possibly sign a new one. Um, and, you know, it's important we do that while we still have capacity to do so as well. 
springing powers of attorney. So how many of you have heard of a springing power of attorney? Nobody? One of you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, springing power of attorney is a power of attorney that basically only comes into effect if you are incapacitated. So as long as you're still able to make your own decisions, this is not going to come into play. It's, you need a you know, specific information that says, you know, in the power of attorney, incapacity is, and then, you know, either maybe a doctor will establish that, or maybe, so, excuse me, somebody else might um, establish that incapacity, like a family member. But um, for the most part, you know, if you have trusted agents and you feel comfortable with them having that authority right away, we don't often need springing powers of attorney. But if it's a situation where, you know, huh, I'm not sure if my daughter is able to make these decisions yet for me, and I'm still good to make these decisions, well, I'm going to limit her authority to be springing so that I can, you know, make sure that I'm incapacitated before she can start doing things for me. So that's kind of what that looks like. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about healthcare powers of attorney. Um, so for the healthcare power of attorney, this is you know giving your agent the ability to make medical decisions. Um, so you know if if you are unconscious and someone needs to consent to a surgery, um, admit or discharge you from a hospital, maybe you know you were coming off anesthesia from a surgery and you just are kind of not not really able to make decisions yet. You know, your agent can help to be able to um, discharge you from the hospital um, or just generally reviewing your medical records as well. So a lot of folks, when they come to my office, ask me, who should be my agent? Well, I can't tell you the answer to that, but I can give you some ideas. Um, so, you know, some folks say, oh, my oldest child, they're the most responsible. I want them to be my agent. Other folks, you know, they say, oh, well, this child lives here in North Carolina, not too far from here. I want that child to be my agent because she's close by or he's close by. Um, sometimes they want their most responsible child, which is smart, especially for a financial power of attorney. Um, you know, sometimes you don't have children, so maybe you pick your sibling or um, maybe you pick multiple siblings. Um, you know, some questions that I have folks think about is, do you want the agents to be the same for your financial power of attorney and your health care power of attorney? Or maybe do you want different people for those documents? And there's no right or wrong answers. It's only whatever's right for you. So um, what I always tell folks is that the right answer is somebody who is trusted, who is responsible, and who is skilled in that they know that, you know, they know their limits and they know when they should seek help, professional help, if they, you know, if it's beyond them. So that would be an example of some, you know, qualities that a good agent possesses. You want to be able to trust them to act in your best interest. Um, if you want more than one agent to serve, which sometimes we do have happen, um, you know, sometimes we have a husband and a wife who are, you know, Oh, we want our child to serve with us as each other's agents. So if something happens to one of us, we don't have to worry. You know, we already have that child if, um, you know, next in line. So kind of figuring out whether you want those folks to have to act unanimously, meaning nobody can make independent decisions. Um, whether you want them to be joint but still have the ability to act independently. Um, or whether you want them to just, you know, have majority rules if you have multiple people acting. Um, if you want them to be able to act as individuals, maybe you just want to have successive agents in order. So those are all some ideas that, you know, we talk about when we're talking about our agents and our estate plan. So, um, like I talked about before, we want to make sure that we review our powers of attorney with an attorney. Um, make sure that they're in compliance with the new law. Make sure that they're still the agents that you want to have. Um, verify that you have successor agents. So if something happens to your first agent, you don't want to you know, have your power of attorney not be effective because you don't have anyone to act after that first person. So we can nominate a successor agent. Um, and then also just verify that these people are still the best people to act in your best interest. Um, living wills. Who has heard of one of those before? Who has one of those? Good, a lot of you do. So, 
So a living will is a healthcare um, instructions, basically, regarding end-of-life decisions. So um, what triggers a living will to start, you know, to be in effect? Um, the inability for you to give directions about um, the use of artificial life-sustaining procedures. Um, and then also there, a physician would have to determine that your death is imminent and that artificial, if artificial life-sustaining procedures aren't utilized, that you would pass away. So um, typically, you know, most living wills say that in the event that your death is imminent and you have a terminal illness, an incurable disease, or you're in a persistent vegetative state, that in those circumstances, you do not want to receive artificial life prolonging measures, which most people would agree with, and so oftentimes most people will sign those living wills. If you don't have one of those and that's something you're interested in, talk with an attorney about that. Um, so you always want to think about would you want any of these things, so pain relieving drugs, artificial hydration, um, life prolonging procedures like um, you know life support, things like that, artificial nutrition, those are all things to be thinking about when you're creating a living will and also when you create a healthcare power of attorney to talk to your agent about so they know what your wishes are. And then um, we have our last will and testament. So um, a last will and testament is written instructions on how your property should be distributed upon your death. Um, you are going to designate in that document an executor or sometimes known as a personal representative and that person is going to administer your estate. So anything that you own upon your passing. Um, sometimes, you know, if you have minor children, which probably most of your children are grown, but you know, it's possible. Um, if you have, um, you know, grandchildren that maybe you are looking after or something like that, um, you know, then there are, um, you know, provisions that can be put in wills as well to designate who you would want to be that guardian, um, who you would want to um, have hold property for them until they turn 25. And so that's an important one too, is sometimes, you know, under our will, we want to make sure there's provisions there for grandchildren. But if our grandchildren are 18 or younger, they can't really manage that money themselves. They're going to have to have a guardianship appointed to manage that money. And so, um, you know, having certain provisions in your will to be able to have somebody else manage that until they're old enough. Usually we consider 25 old enough because they're out of college and probably have a little bit more, you know, life under their belt to be able to manage things for them. Um, but, you know, around 25, then that's when they, most of the time they can have that outright and manage it themselves. Uh, last will and testament. So, um, in North Carolina, um, your will has to be self-proving, which means there are two witnesses and a notary that have watched you sign it. Um, you know, a lot of people have what we would call I love you wills, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about honey, I love you dearly, but wills. So there's two kind of, you know, different things there. Um, you know, bypass clauses and spousal election, so we'll talk about those a little bit too that can be part of um, your will. Um, sometimes there are things that people refer to as will substitutes. So sometimes, you know, a contract or a policy with a beneficiary designation. Um, for example, a lot of annuities you're able to designate a pay on death or transfer on death, that beneficiary designation. Similarly, your life insurance policies, you will also have that type of designation. So those things all make sure that that property passes to your beneficiary, but they don't pass under your will. Um, and a lot of times, too, retirement accounts, they don't pass under your will most times. They pass to whoever your beneficiary designations are. And so just making sure that you check your accounts, your retirement accounts, whatever type of accounts you have or policies that you have, making sure that you check those beneficiary designations to make sure that, one, whoever you listed there is alive and you're able to have that pass to them. Because otherwise, if you don't have a beneficiary listed, or maybe the beneficiaries you listed have passed, those assets are also going to have to pass under your will. And so that just makes things a little bit more complicated in terms of the administration process. Um, as I mentioned, there may be um, you know, investment accounts or bank accounts that you could put a pay on death or a transfer on death beneficiary designations. Again, that's going to pass outside of your will. 
um, versus passing through that um, through the probate process. And we'll talk about probate a little bit too. Um, titling accounts in real estate. So sometimes it makes sense to update, um, you know, the holding of property. So sometimes we update that to be joint tenants with right of survivorship. Um, same thing with accounts. And this is something you don't want to do for real estate on your own. You definitely want to work with an attorney on that type of thing when deeds are involved because that can just cause a lot of problems if you try to do it on your own. Um, but, you know, those are options to be able to try to avoid that probate process, which a lot of folks like to do. So, like we talked about, it's really important to know who your beneficiaries are and make sure that you have beneficiary designations and review those pretty regularly to make sure that they're still who you want them to be. Um, you know, life happens, so I call them the 40s, um, which we'll get to in a second, but two of them are listed here, death, divorce, and then, you know, illness also as well. So sometimes it makes sense to list folks, and then, you know, a few years later, something happens, and it might not make sense anymore. So that's why it's really important to continue reviewing those every year or every couple of years to make sure it's still right. Um, comprehensive estate planning. So that, you know, when I talk about comprehensive estate planning, I'm talking about planning for during your life. So what if you have short-term disability? What if you need long-term care? Um, and then also planning for your death, after your death. So we're not, when we talk about estate planning, we're not just talking about a will and that's, that's it, period, end of story. We're talking about, you know, everything in between as well. Um, sometimes, um, if we transfer property to our children during our lifetime, um, you know, Medicaid could be something that may be needed by some of you or um, some of your friends in the future. And so if we transfer property directly to a child during, during our lifetime, um, and it's within five years of applying for Medicaid, then we could have a penalty. So we don't want to do that. Um, we always want to talk with an attorney before we make trans big transfers like that. I usually tell my clients, you know, anything over $1,000 is something to think about. Um, and the other thing is transferring outright to children even after your death. There's things that we need to think about too there, and that's where the 40s come into play. So divorce, debt, disability, and death. So um, sometimes it makes sense to transfer property to a child instead of giving it to them outright. It might make sense to give it to them in trust. When I say child, I'm not always referring to, you know, little children. I'm oftentimes referring to adult children. And so, you know, what if your son or daughter gets divorced? You know, if you give it to them outright, that money that they receive could be subject to their divorce. Um, if they have debts, that money could be subject to their creditors. If they have a disability, that money could kick them off of that government benefit if they are on one and receiving one. Um, and then also, what if they die? What happens to their share? So um, if they don't have an estate plan in place, then what's going to happen? So those are all things also that we consider when we're helping folks put together a, a comprehensive estate plan. And now I'll talk a little bit about trust. Um, there's a couple different kinds out there that you might hear about, and so I'll kind of talk about two of the main ones that we hear about, um, revocable trust and irrevocable trust, and we use a lot of those within our office. So. We'll talk about that too. And as you can see here, trusts are marked as during life and after death. So they help you during your lifetime and after your death to make sure your property is properly administered. Um, so there are various types of trust. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot in when we're helping folks figure out what the right trust for them is, is it's kind of like build, buying a car, right? Um, so it depends on what your needs are and what's going to be a good fit. So maybe you want a sports car, right? Everybody wants a sports car. Um, but maybe you also want, um, you know, an SUV or a truck for the utility or a van for the utility to be able to haul things or carry multiple passengers or a wheelchair, things like that. Um, and a, a sports car is not going to accomplish those things. And so um, when we're building a trust, we think about buying a car because we're going to try to figure out, you know, what's going to be the best benefit for you and for your family. Um, so our framework for understanding trust. So um, 
we're talking about vehicles, I'm going to stick with the vehicle analogy here. Um, so it's going to be based on your objectives and what external factors you have going on. So maybe there would be tax consequences, maybe it's one of those 40s we talked about for your beneficiaries. Um, you know, we also want to find out what, what assets are there to fund the trust. You know, before you can drive a car, you have to put gasoline in it. And so the same thing occurs, and, and gasoline is expensive these days, so you know, we really got to be careful. Um, <laughs> but um, assets, you know, to fund the trust, we need to see what's there to fund it, because if it's not properly funded, then technically it doesn't exist. And so we have to see if maybe we're going to put real estate in it. Maybe we're going to put some other financial assets in it. You know, we need to figure out what we're putting in there and how it's going to be distributed. Um, we also have to figure out who's driving the car. So who's going to be responsible for the assets that are in the trust? Who will administer that for us? And so again, we're going to look at, you know, our trustee, they want to be a trusted person, um, kind of like our powers of attorney agent that we talked about. Um, a lot of folks established trust for the following reasons. So um, probate avoidance. So probate is a process basically whereby your assets are administered through the court system. It typically takes, you know, six months to a year, sometimes longer, depending on the number of assets that are there. Um, and most of the time, unless you have one of those will substitutes or, um, you know, some type of trust set up, your assets are going to go through that probate process. And so a lot of folks don't want their money tied up for their family. They want them to have access to it pretty immediately. And so they'll create a trust and put the assets in the trust to avoid that process. Um, sometimes we create trust, um, irrevocable trust, for long-term care protection. Um, sometimes we do it for controlled gifting. So, for example, when I talked about that child who maybe, excuse me, has a debt, um, you know, if they have debt, we want a controlled gifting. So we maybe don't want them to have that access right away. We want somebody else to be responsible for that money during that time. Um, beneficiaries who have supplemental needs, or like I said, um, underage beneficiaries, all things that are important to think about when we're creating a trust to make sure we have the right terms within that trust to be able to accommodate those beneficiaries. And then lastly, management of assets during your life and during your, upon your death. Um, and sometimes also we set up trusts for inherited IRAs as well to be able to kind of manage who receives that, what if they pass away, who's the next person, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of different types of trusts out there. This is just a couple um, to kind of give you some information on that. So grantor trust, basically that means that, you know, you're going to use your social security number and it's pretty much not going to affect your taxes in any way. Non-grantor trust, um, that's, you know, usually created by you uh, for somebody else. They are not the grantor. Um, there's revocable, which means it can be changed at any time. Irrevocable, just like it sounds, it cannot be revoked. And a lot of times those are used for protective measures in case someone needs long-term care Medicaid, um, asset protection trust, special needs trust, um, again, making sure that those assets are preserved for whatever the intended beneficiary is, whoever that is. Um, so revocable versus irrevocable, I get a lot of questions about what's the difference. Um, so, you know, with a revocable trust, you have more flexibility and can freely um, you know, amend that if you need to, as long as you have capacity to do so, you can also revoke it at any time. Um, you know, those are typically for individuals um, who establish those. Um, they will also serve as their own trustee, but sometimes they don't. I've had a lot of clients who, you know, they said, I'm getting too old to manage all this for myself. I'd rather have my kids do it for me. Can I just resign? And I'm like, yeah, you can, <laughs> as long as your kids want to do it. So. Uh, their kids stepped up, and that's great. Um, they're also beneficial for blended family situations. So maybe you got remarried later in life. You want to make sure that you know certain things go to certain parts of the family. That's where trust can come in really handy for making sure that things end up where they're supposed to be. Um, and then with an irrevocable trust, also known as an asset protection trust, um, those are a little bit more difficult to change or, or amend because they only can be amended under statute um, or by a judge, um, typically, 
And so most of the time when we create those, we know for sure these are the beneficiaries, this is you know the assets that are going to be in here, and we're not going to change it. It's pretty much set in stone. Um, and sometimes also irrevocable trust can be established at death. So sometimes if we have a trust under our will, for example, the trust for a grandchild who's a minor, for example, is irrevocable, meaning no one can change it after it's set up. Um, or you know, at, at during your lifetime, you are allowed to also create these trusts. But irrevocable does not mean untouchable. So it does not mean that we tie the ribbon on top of the gift and can never open it again. Um, you know, some folks can still get in there, just most likely not us who create it. Um, sometimes it's important to consider um, transfer taxes, so um, there are, you know, different things that we might want to think about. I'll, I'm not going to get too much into that because really for our purposes in Estate Planning 101, that's not going to be something we'll talk about today too much, but just to give you an idea and also something that you might want to talk with your financial advisor and or your estate planning attorney about. Um, so what um, a lot of clients come to me and they say, I have a will, but I guess I don't really understand what the difference is between my will and if I create a trust. And so um, the, the common things that, you know, most folks are worried about when they're thinking about those things is one, um, North Carolina does not have an inheritance tax right now. so. You should be okay, but you know those laws could change, of course. Um, probate fees, so there are quite a bit of fees that go into the probate process. Um, whereas if you have a trust, you're kind of paying that a little bit on the front end to set it up, but your loved ones aren't going to have to worry about that down the line. Um, you know, when we have an executor, they are entitled to fees, but they do have to petition a court for those fees usually. Whereas a trustee, you know, they're not acting under the court's rules. They're acting under the rules of your trust. And so if the trust says that they're allowed to be paid, then the trust allows them to be paid. Um, they don't have to get anybody's permission most of the time unless we put that language in the trust. Um, and then also just whether a beneficiary can contest. So we just want to make sure that if we're worried about somebody contesting a will or a trust, we include what's called an interim clause which just means, you know, you're not going to contest this because if you do, you might lose your share. So um, sometimes that's important to include as well. Um, like I talked about before a little bit, we do have um, retirement plan um, trust that we can create. Um, sometimes, you know, it's great to have an IRA or um, other types of retirement assets to accumulate wealth during your lifetime, but it's not necessarily great to always die with those assets. Um, and so, you know, creating certain types of trusts can help with income tax consequences to beneficiaries. Um, it can also, you know, with that require man mandatory distributions for them. Um, the SECURE Act is something that, you know, is more recent in, in law and so um, children are required to withdraw over 10 years. So that's just something to consider as well as your plan. Um, so if you are thinking about doing a trust for, you know, planning for long-term care, um, that would be your irrevocable trust. Um, you can be the trustee of that to start out. However, if you lose capacity at some point, your successor trustees would step in, but it still allows you to be kind of in control of those assets. Um, your trust has a built-in will to transfer assets after your death. So basically, we call that a pour-over will. So we have over here, our trust is like a bucket. And then over here we have our um, will, and it acts like a broom to sweep anything in that was outside of the trust that you're passing. Um, so that also can be done. And then um, a lot of times when we put assets in that type of trust, they um, can avoid being what's considered countable assets for Medicaid purposes. If you were, or you know, a friend or somebody like that, or to need Medicaid in the future, this might be the type of trust that they would want to create now, so that in five years from now, that money could still be in there protected. So what happens if I did not plan ahead? Can I protect anything? So we're gonna take a detour here and talk about that a little bit. Um, so how do you pay for long-term care? Sometimes it's out of your own pocket, sometimes um, it's through long-term care insurance, and sometimes it's through other benefits like 
VA, um, Medicare, or Medicaid. And so those are a lot of the ways that folks do so. I'm not gonna go too much into this side of things. Um, you know, long-term care, as you guys know, can be pretty expensive over time. Um, you know, without planning, your life savings could be exhausted in a short period of time, especially if you need, you know, a significant amount of care. Um, veteran benefits sometimes can be available to veterans and their spouses. Um, you know, there's service-connected and non-service-connected benefits, and so those are things that, you know, if you're needing assistance, paying for care might make sense um, in terms of looking into. Um, Medicare, as you most of you probably know what that is, a uh, federal health insurance program to insure individuals in these categories, so age 65 and older, um, under 65 with certain disabilities, and um, these other two certain diseases. Um, so, you know, Medicare typically only helps pay for, you know, uh, facility care for 21 days. If you've been in the hospital, you need to go to rehab, that kind of thing. Um, 21 days is usually the max, but sometimes you can appeal that and get a little bit longer. Um, let's see. They do pay some um, nursing home costs um, at times when folks need nursing care or um, rehabilitation services. Um, and so uh, prior hospital stay, inpatient hospital stay, I should say, of three consecutive days is required for that to go into effect. Um, and these days it's becoming more and more difficult to meet that criteria. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip over this Medicare portion um, because a lot of this, you know, I'm, I feel like you guys probably have quite a bit of information on already. Um, as far as Medicaid goes, um, you know, I'm going to precursor this with, you have to be at a facility that accepts Medicaid and you have to have that facility agree for you to be in a Medicaid bed. So some facilities do not accept Medicaid and that's okay. Other facilities do. Um, and so that's something that, you know, you would want to check with the facility. For example, you want to check with Friends Home to see do they accept Medicaid and, or, you know, would you be allowed to get in and have a Medicaid bed um, if that was something that you needed in the future. Um, these are just kind of some facts on Medicaid and long-term care. Um, if folks are on Medicaid, what does it pay for? So nursing home care, sometimes it pays for in-home CAP or PACE programs. And then also if you um, are eligible under the income requirements, it can pay for assisted living or memory care as well. Um, for uh, Medicaid though, it cannot pay for most in-home care. So just, you know, generally speaking, if folks need, you know, a CNA to come in a few times a week, probably not gonna pay for that. <laughs> Um, and then if they're over the certain income limits, it's not gonna pay for assisted living or memory care, and it definitely doesn't pay for independent living. Um, so an uh, income, or I mean a Medicaid applicant must meet certain income and asset requirements in order to apply, um, in order to qualify. Um, a lot of times, you know, when folks come to us, their assets are well over the range or their income is over the range for assisted living or memory care, so they can't qualify. Um, but we kind of help folks to assess whether that will be, you know, a good option for them as well. Um, category sources for Medicaid, um, I'll talk a little bit about that. You know, generally everything you have except for your real estate that if you live there, your residence, or you intend to return home, um, you know, and then certain life insurance policies are the only exemptions. These are all countable. Everything is pretty much countable. Uh, Non-countable resources, like I said, the residence is exempt, but it is it can be subject to a state recovery. Um, and then also some um, jointly held properties, again, are exempt, but can be subject to recovery. Um, one motor vehicle is allowed, so if you have two, you cannot have two. They will have you sell one and use that money first. Um, and then also um, non-countable resources, so if, like we talked about that irrevocable trust, if you would put money in there five years before, or property five years before you needed Medicaid, then that property would also be protected. Um, you don't count household belongings, so you get to keep all those, yay! Um, irrevocable prepaid burial accounts, that's something that a lot of folks choose to spend their money on because you know, when you pass away, your, your kids or your loved ones are going to have to figure out how do I pay for this unless you prearranged it. 
So I usually do recommend when I'm doing planning with folks to go ahead and do that if they have the means to do so. Um, cash value of life insurance policies if the face value is under $10,000. So if you don't have a life insurance policy, this is something that you may want to look into. Um, and then term and group life policies, sometimes folks have those, sometimes they don't. I just kind of mention those on the side. Um, and then cemetery plots. So um, if you have a plot, that's not going to be countable against you either. Um, so there is some protection for the spouse. So if you're in this situation, um, or if you have a friend who's in this situation, you know, the healthy spouse, known as the community spouse, um, doesn't have to become impoverished just because they're paying for somebody's care. So that is something that we deal with a lot. Um, for example, John and Agnes, you know, um, Agnes needs nursing home care. And so what happens is that, um, you know, we split the assets in half and um, John can keep $90,000 and then Agnes has to spend her half down to 2,000. And so we can spend that on a lot of different things. For example, maybe John and Agnes want a new car and so they buy a new car. They have a mortgage so they pay off their debt um, on the mortgage. Um, maybe they need some home improvement done, so they pay for that. And then also their funeral expenses. And then by then, they're down to the $2,000. Agnes gets to go on Medicaid, and John gets to keep the $90,000 in the house and the car. Um, but there's also other options like purchasing. Let's say they don't have those home repairs or a mortgage or a new car to buy. There's options also to do certain type of um, what's called SPIA insurance contracts basically Medicaid compliant annuities to be able to protect things for the healthy spouse. Um, for a single person, basically, you know, Medicaid is only available after a single person has $2,000 or less, provided that they meet the income requirements for assisted living memory care, or if they're in nursing, there's not really too much of an income cap there. Um, but they can have $2,000 or less. So it's really about making sure that you get the right help Sometimes you can protect about half of what they have left. Um, sometimes we do spend balance for single folks. Um, it just depends on their situation. Every situation is different. So we kind of have to play that case by case basis as folks come to us. The five year look back period, a lot of folks ask me about this. Um, it's a period basically where if you apply for Medicaid today, they're going to look back five years from today, and they're going to say, hey, have you made any transfers to anybody that's not your spouse? Or have you made any transfers that wasn't an expense to you or your property? And if so, that, that could cause a penalty. So um, ineligibility for every $7,110 this year. So that's something to think about as well if you think that that might be something that is important for you or for a friend or family member. Um, so this is just an example. Um, you have a house that's worth $100,000 fair market value, and you require skilled care within five years of that date of transferring your house. So, um, you know, you'll be essentially, if you transfer your house to, let's say, one of your children, that is unfortunately one of the transfers that's not allowed. So you want to work with an attorney and make sure that you do the right type of transfer so you don't have that penalty. But if you did that, your penalty will be um, 14.06 months. So that's quite a long time. It's a year, a little bit over a year where you wouldn't be eligible to get care paid for by Medicaid if, if that was for you or for a family, friend, or things like that. Um, and that means you'll pay privately during that time. A lot of folks tell me, well, can't I just put my kid's name on my property? No, you cannot do that. I mean, you can, but there will be that penalty and it still creates ineligibility, and also life happens. So like we talked about, the 40s, that's something to be careful of too if you're thinking about transferring property to one of your children to try to protect. Um, exceptions to the transfer penalty, so if a child is under age 21, um, if they have blindness or a disability, or if the caregiver, um, if they are a caregiver child. So um, not too many reasons why you'd be able to do that or you know, why a family friend or things like that would be able to do that. Um, so you know, planning for each phase of life. So like I talked about at the beginning, we are the elder law firm, but we don't just help the elderly. We want to plan for each phase of life, young adult, um, young family, through the elderly person. 
And so um, powers of attorney, POAs, that's what we call them in our law office, but powers of attorney, advanced directives, as a lot of times what folks refer to as your healthcare power of attorney and your living will. Um, and wills, if there's any assets, are important to you know pay attention to um, and also make sure we pay attention to the titling on the deeds. Um, we want to think about those children's trusts again, you know, minor children, that kind of thing. Um, and then we also want to think about designating, you know, who we're going to designate um, as a beneficiary, whether we would designate a, a person, or if we have a trust, are we going to designate that trust as the beneficiary? Um, did we name a contingent beneficiary to make sure that somebody is there to take care of that for us? And so, um, you know, in the middle accumulation years, we're going to think about the same types of things. Um, you know, we want to talk to a financial advisor at that time. So maybe, you know, some of you have kids that are in this middle accumulation years. And so, you know, make sure they talk with their financial advisor to make sure they're on the right track for retirement, um, things like that. So those are all important factors for us to think about as well. And as estate planners, you know, we're not their financial advisor, but we think about those things too and say, hey, have you met with a financial advisor yet? Because if not, that might be a good idea. Um, Pre-retirement years, um, so again, similarly, we want to think about those thing, same things. Maybe we want to think about that special retirement trust I was talking about. Um, maybe we want to think about long-term care insurance during that time or life insurance with a long-term care insurance rider. Again, continuing to talk with the financial advisor to stay on the right track and then making sure we have our correct beneficiary designations because we just never know what's going to happen. And then post-retirement years. Um, so again, estate planning and long-term care planning, we want to make sure we have that all in place. Make sure that we've talked to an attorney about you know, what, what we might need to do if we need to protect assets or if we need to set up a trust to avoid probate, things like that. Um, again, maybe it's possible to still get insurance with a long-term care rider. Um, and then again, continuing to talk with your financial advisor about making sure you're on the right track. And don't forget to double check your beneficiary designations. We just add a little bit every year. <laughs> um, so where do you go from here? Um, basically, you know, a lot of you raised your hand already that you've looked at your estate plan recently and that, you know, maybe you updated it recently, maybe you haven't. But um, making sure that if you don't have that plan in place, get started today. Don't wait because the longer we wait, you know, the worst chance we have of our uh, leaving things to luck, right? What we talked about at the beginning, if we don't have powers of attorney, we're leaving it to luck. Um, and so we want to make sure that we take care of that right away and make sure that we work with an attorney who knows, you know, what provisions need to be in there. Um, and then after that, you get to enjoy your peace of mind and know that your loved ones and your property are taken care of. So um, that's pretty much the end of my presentation today. And I hope you guys all learned something useful today. Um, is there anything that anybody has questions about or also just wants to share something they learned today? You can raise your hand if you want to. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the necessity or law regarding notice of death if a child, adult child, brings a parent from another state to this state. Do you have to file two notices of death or just for the death occurred? It depends. Um, it depends on if property was owned in the state that they brought them from and what that state's requirements are. Um, but for North Carolina, most of the time you have to notify here. And then sometimes, you know, we've had some clients who had property in Virginia or we have property in um, South Carolina or other states. You know, sometimes if they have property in those states, we do want to notify um, those, um, you know, due to those properties. So it pays to get a lawyer to pay Absolutely, to yes. I, it's always good to at least have a consultation with an attorney and see if it's something, you know, that they um, may or may not be able to help with and or if you need, or, if need their help to be able to accomplish that. Well, it is that we have to take Uh huh. Yeah, and so that can happen sometimes, but yeah, it just depends. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. 
what is the difference in a general power of attorney and uh, financial power of attorney? Most of the time they are the same thing. They're just referred to a little bit differently. Um, the general power of attorney, also known as durable power of attorney as well. So kind of like it can go by three different names there, which can make it confusing for folks. Um, but the important thing is that you want to make sure that a general or a financial power of attorney are also a durable power of attorney because not all of them are durable, which means they continue even after you become incapacitated. So that's an important thing to have an attorney look over and make sure that you have the, the right language in there for it to be able to continue even during your incapacity. When does the springing factor come into play? The springing factor comes into play if that language is in the power of attorney, and basically it, it usually says, you know, uh, two doctors have determined that I am incompetent to make decisions or incapacitated to make decisions, um, or sometimes it says that my spouse has determined that I'm no longer able to make decisions, um, but it has to have that language in the power of attorney to become springing. Otherwise, most of the time it is a, um, effective immediately. Is it advisable to name multiple members of the younger generation as successive? Absolutely, it is important to have multiple agents listed because let's say something happens to your first agent, you know, let's say they become incapacitated or they pass away, you know, then you don't want to be left with no one. So it's, it's really important. important. You're doing it jointly, so you do it as successive. You can do it either way. There's, you know, a lot of ways that it can be done. Um, it depends on your circumstances and what's right for you. Like, it's not necessarily going to be the same answer for every person that asks me that question, but it's something that we can talk about and see, if, you know, what's going to be the right situation for you. Yes? How much license does a trustee have to change the conditions that you put forth in your trust? That's a great question, and I get that one a lot, actually. Um, so most of the time, when a, a trust is created, the trust um, usually becomes irrevocable, if it isn't already, upon the person's death, meaning it cannot be changed at all by the trustee. The only discretion that they usually have is um, if you know it lists certain discretion, like about distributing income to a beneficiary or principal to a beneficiary. Sometimes they have that discretion depending on the type of trust created for the beneficiary. Um, but they pretty much, like 99% of the time, they do not have the ability to make changes to um, the actual terms of the final distributions of the trust. So. It's, it's a pretty um, secure document. And the other reason a lot of folks like it as well is it doesn't have to go through the court. It is private within your family. So that's another reason folks like that one too. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to know about uh, codicil. Codicil? Uh, does it have to be made in an attorney's office or can you do it yourself? Does it have to be witnessed and so forth? Sure. Um, a codicil requires the same um, self-proving as a will, so it has to be witnessed and notarized, two witnesses and a notary. Um, most of the time it is best to work with an attorney on that just to make sure it's done correctly. Um, but a lot of times these days, since we're not using typewriters anymore and we have computers, it's real easy for us to just create a brand new will. We don't have to you know, make a codicil anymore. Those were kind of used quite a long time ago when we were still using typewriters and we didn't want to have to retype the entire will. Um, so nowadays we don't have to do those too often, but occasionally sometimes folks still use them as well. But I would recommend, yes, I would work with an attorney on that too, just to make sure that it's executed correctly because if it's not, then it won't be valid. Any other questions? So the, the, uh, will grown by the individual and his house in the last days is not allowed in North Carolina anymore? They do. We actually do allow for those types of okay. wills still. Um, yeah. They're called holographic wills. Holographic wills. Uh -huh. And they're not very common these days. Most of the time folks just, you know, but we've had a couple that, you know, somebody found it under the mattress. <laughs> um, and so... Yes, those do exist, um, and they are allowed under certain conditions. 
But, you know, it has to be in the testator or testatrix, which is just a fancy way of saying the person who writes the will, has to be in their handwriting, and it has to be signed by them. Right. So if it's not, you know, I've had a lot of folks say, oh, my, you know, my dad typed this up and then he signed it. Well, that's not in his handwriting, so it doesn't count most of the time. Hmm. So um, that's, that's why it's important that you just get it on actual paper, notarized, witnessed, all the things, and you don't have to worry about that. Yes, ma'am. Our family has a cemetery plot mm -hmm. with multiple sections in it. And if you have the right to be buried in that plot, is that ownership of property? Technically speaking, yes, it is owned by you, um, and you or and or some of your family. Um, and a lot of times we've actually had folks put in their will or in their trust that they want a certain person to be able to be buried there and give that plot to somebody. So that's something that a lot of folks think about as well. I haven't had quite as many people do it, but um, a couple have done it for sure, and it was nice that they thought of that. Well, do we have all our questions answered today? It looks like it. No more hands are going up, so that's good. <laughs> Well, I hope you guys learned something today and took, took something valuable away from today. And I appreciate your time. Mary, is there anything I need to do on this computer to get this off of you? I don't think so. Okay. Lauren. Yes. Do you uh, provide any of the handouts that you showed here? Um. I probably can get Cynthia to send one over. Um, I don't have them today, but I can 